in memory of the six million. And we say these words in remembrance. Ashrei HaGafor, blessed is the match consumed in kindling flame. Blessed is the flame that burns in the secret places, fastness of the heart. Blessed is the heart with the strength to stop its beating for honor's sake. Blessed is the match consumed in kindling flame. Our theme tonight is, as we gather, is about the hidden stories of the Shoah. Part of our challenge is to continue to tell the stories of our families, of people that we didn't even know, in part to keep their memory alive, in part to teach future generations of exactly what happened, of the evil that befell our people and the world. And so it is up to us to ensure that the stories of the individuals continue to be shared and told. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to hear the story uh, of some of our temple members whose families were affected by the events of World War II. Uh, and we are going to hear uh, the story in particular of, uh, of one person who was almost erased from Jewish history. And so uh, as we lit this candle, we sing the words now of Maimonides, um, Nima Amin, I believe with perfect faith that the Messiah is coming, despite it all, I still believe, words that were sung very often in the camps and words that were sung in the Warsaw Ghetto and in the ghettos of Europe. ordained as a rabbi in Berlin in the late 30s. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about her tonight, but uh, it was only a few years ago that her story was rediscovered when Rabbi Sally Priesen was ordained in 1972 by the Hebrew Union College, was touted as the world's first woman rabbi because Rabbi Jonas's story had been erased, forgotten. And so tonight we share her words and then we're going to see a very short film about rediscovering Rabbi Regina Jonas. If worry and jealousy seek our undoing, she wrote, then we should think about Yiskor in such a way that we carry on the work of our ancestors from Sinai, in that we today are truly their children, and in that we are parents of the future generations. Then the chain does not break, and we gain the strength to carry up nobly these historical responsibilities and to thank God sincerely that Yizkor, remembrance, has become the celebration of our soul. This film that we're about to share with you is a short film uh, in the footsteps of Regina Jonas. Uh, it, what, you might recognize one or two rabbis that are in this film. It documents a trip that a number of us took in 2014 
to retrace the steps of Regina Jonas, to lift up her story, and to dedicate a memorial to her at, in Theresien, in Theresienstadt, uh, where she was uh, worked alongside the great Viktor Frankl for two years before she was deported to Auschwitz. One second, sorry about that. Regina Jonas had the passion and the desire to become a rabbi when it was completely new. She faced a lot of antagonism. She had no role models. They were all men. And yet there was something inside of her that moved her forward. People made such a fuss about us. Of how did you how did you possibly imagine that you could be a rabbi? And it you know, wasn't possible. So now that I learned that she was born in 1902 and as an 11-year-old, discerned that she was supposed to be a rabbi. In 1913, in Germany, what an absolutely remarkable story, regardless of the rest of the story. Well, I think one of the great gifts of feminism is discovering all these stories that have been hidden away for so long. And Regina Jonas is one of those people we should have known about. And here she lived when she was already officiating as a teacher and preacher, a rabbinical... I think Regina Jonas changes how we think about Jewish history to recognize that the first woman who became a rabbi became a rabbi here in Berlin in December of 1935. It shifts the kind of narrative that we tell about um, feminism. It makes the post-war feminist movement, which we associate very much with the United States, actually to have roots that go back further. This is it. This is her whole life in a box. I think the most powerful moment for me was when we were with the archivist and you could see Regina Jonas' papers. And there weren't very many of them. But in some sense, it appears that she chose those papers. So in a way, she was creating how she wanted to be remembered. And uh, I, I told before that we don't know exactly how these papers got here. We think mm -hmm. she gave them to the Jewish community before she was sent to the Hinstadt, so about in 1942. And then we just have a fragment. We only have a fragment. But how wonderful that we do have that fragment. We have the original ordination um, document, wow. that letter, so to speak. And Leo Beck signs it, not signing the smicha, but signing that it's a true copy. <laughs> Which means he was doing some political, I think, some political balancing. He was the head of all of German Jewry, so he couldn't say, you know, I'm ordaining a woman in 35. This would have been problematic, but he took that step as far as he could. Nobody knowing about her, even though Leo Beck knew her and survived, and many other people knew her and survived, didn't talk about her. So this is kind of the, the, the weird... For many of us, that's really the question. Right, right. So. Silencing women. For me, it's writing women out of history. It's an evening of firsts in which we honor Regina Jonas, the first woman rabbi in modern times, and bring together for the very first time the pioneering rabbis who were the first to be ordained by their denominational seminaries. I was always pleased that I wasn't really first, as I never wanted to be. Um, so I, was, I knew that maybe there was a woman some form of ordination. We weren't sure of her name, um, but the rumor was there. I do a lot of speaking, and I always try to mention her. 
feeling that whenever we gather to talk about these kinds of subjects, we bring honor to her memory. So many pilgrimages up mountains. Now at Terezin with Regina, a different pilgrimage on sanctified ground. She was the pastor. She was the teacher. She was their rabbi. And to be in that place with other women rabbis, which are her legacy, was quite powerful to me. This is from an article that she wrote in 1938. God has placed abilities and callings in, in our hearts without regard to gender. Thus, each of us has the duty, whether man or woman, to realize those gifts God has given. If you look at things this way, one takes woman and man for what they are, human beings. The texts that she was looking at were the same texts that I had been thinking about in terms of finding support for female rabbis. I believe that the question of whether a woman may make halachic decisions as a rabbinirin may very clearly be seen as permitted. And it is not necessary to continue to linger over this matter. For, for a second, it was. Could I have done what she did? No, I don't think I could have done what she did, but for a moment I had a glimpse of it because I was speaking her words. The words on the plaque that come from one of her sermons that have somehow miraculously survived, to live that kind of a life, uh, I think, makes her a symbol for all humanity. It's a little bit like reconnecting with a long-lost relative. Old, older relative that I always should have known, who's part of my story, who, whom I had never even known about. She ministered to people at a time of such grave crisis and inhumanity, and yet she not only kept her own spirits and faith going, she kept the faith going of those who were uh, imprisoned there. That's what a rabbi does, is to try and offer hope in the darkest of times. I just can't even believe that her papers were hidden away for, for 50 years and that nobody really talked about her. So I have to say to myself, was her story kept from us because she's a woman? And then I start to wonder about how many other stories have been kept from us.
I can tell you it was one of the most powerful experiences of my, my own life to be there and to walk in her footsteps and to rediscover a story that all of us didn't know. And sharing those stories, especially of those who perished in the Shoah and of our family members who were involved in liberation is one of the most important ideas. As we heard earlier, the words of Rabbi Yonas, use core to remember is vitally important to the core of who we are as Jews. And so tonight I've invited several of our co congregation members to share the story of their family, of their experience during these years. And so it's my privilege to uh, ask Larry Levi first, if you'll share some of the stories of your family uh, in a kind of, in a unique setting from Italy. Thank you, Rabbi, and thanks Rabbi Max as well for inviting me to speak about my family for a few minutes. Um, it's always an honor to share my family story with Cole and me. Uh, here is my family in 1932 in uh, Torino, Italy. My father's there on the left, the third from the left, next to his mother. Do I have control of this? There's, can you see my cursor? Uh, my father's third from the left. Um, he, his father was a lawyer and his grandparents are seated on the, on the bench there, um, had a coat couture company that employed over a hundred employees. And uh, they were doing quite well until 1938 when the anti-Semitic laws um, came into effect. And within a year, my dad, his, his parents and his brother fled to, um, fled to Paris and then to the United States. Uh, my great grandparents, uh, Teodoro and um, Rosetta Sacerdote were arrested. They were betrayed, arrested, held in an internment camp in Italy for uh, three months before my great-grandmother was sent to Auschwitz where she was murdered. And I want to read just this short um, paragraph that she wrote from the camp. She managed to smuggle out a few, a few letters. And this was her last letter before she was deported to Auschwitz. And she says, I am desperate. They talk about shipping us out and we will be with the SS. I will never see my children again and I am terrorized by the long trip. Who knows how we will be transported. It will be weeks with many stops. Grief and sorrow are our daily bread. I cried desolately alone without health. I had hoped until the last moment to be liberated, but my ordeal is not over. To die abandoned far away is an indescribable martyrdom. Kisses to all. I do not know when I will be able to write. <laughs> After all these years, it's still very difficult to read those. She was sent to Auschwitz where she was murdered when she got there the same year as Rabbi Jonas. And if we can go to the next picture, Max. Um, this last June, um, I went on this wonderful trip with the, uh, with the temple led by uh, <clears throat> Rabbi Edgar and Rabbi Ellie. Um, and it was such, such a healing trip to go to Auschwitz and uh, there at the entrance where I figure my great grandmother was divided, uh, was taken away from those who were going to live for a while. Um, very painful to be there and yet very wonderful to share that with my temple family. And um, I, I feel that one of the last liberations we need to do is liberate ourselves from, from the trauma of our families and to, and to feel free and uh, free to remember this experience, but to free our spirits from it as well. So thank you very much for the opportunity. By the way, my, oh, next slide. There's one more slide. And um, this is my beautiful family now. That's my sister on the left in the middle between her two daughters. I, my sister's uh, with us on this uh, Zoom, as well as my niece, who's there at the end, Tate. And uh, so our family survives, is happy, and uh, having um, burgers and uh, french fries in Tel Aviv. So thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you for sharing that moving story with us. Um, it's a privilege to ask Jack Egan 
um, longtime temple member to share his family story and his story um, because he too is a survivor. This is a particularly important Yom HaShoah. It was the 70th fifth anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz earlier this year and soon it will be the 75th anniversary of the end of one of the horrors of the 20th century. As much as we lament what goes on in our world, I don't think anyone, anything is equaled what went on. And uh, foremost uh, was uh, the Shoah, uh, the loss of six million Jews. But often you think of the Shoah as that mass extermination. But it's really, as my father used to say, everyone has their own story. And it's in the stories of the people who survived and continue uh, to recall, to write about, that uh, is the most immediate way uh, younger people can still uh, understand and embrace what really happened. Uh, my father told his story. He retired after a uh, career as a waiter and he became a writer. He uh, wrote over a thousand poems, wow. wrote a memoir, and uh, much of it was about the camps and also about the world before the camps. My mother was the sole survivor of her family of 20, of aunts, uncles, her parents, her four brothers. My father lost his first wife and a child and other mem members of his family. He, uh, to me, being a, a child of survivors meant growing up among survivors. Most of my family's friends had been survivors. And what was impressive is the strength and fortitude that they had in rebuilding their lives coming here, were able to, they weren't broken people, although uh, psychologically uh, there uh, <laughs> were many reasons to be, but the survivors uh, continue to be the repository of the, uh, uh, the experience of the Shoah. And, uh, Nowadays, uh, my dad died at 99, about nine years ago. I called him the survivor of survivors. But uh, now we're really down to a handful and many of them were children who uh, were hidden away or managed somehow to uh, uh, be able to uh, live uh, through the war. There were uh, many Poles who uh, were uh, able and to take in young kids. But uh, the stories of the survivors are being preserved uh, in the uh, Museum of the Holocaust and in uh, uh, Steven Spielberg has an archive, but I really am concerned about what the Shoah and what the, uh, the meaning, the gravity of 
the experience will be as all the survivors finally fade away. And uh, uh, that's, uh, my thoughts are with the survivors as my parents were. Jack, we appreciate you sharing a bit of their story tonight and helping their memory stay alive. Robin Waxner has a little different story about her parents uh, and uh, both m mother and father have uh, each had very different kinds of experiences. Robin? Thank you, Rabbi. Um, and thank you both rabbis for um, inviting me to participate um, on this very important day uh, of remembrance. We, the children and grandchildren and other relatives of survivors, um, have to keep these stories alive. And I, I think this is a wonderful way to do that. Um, as anti-Semitism in our world seems to be increasing, um, I'm actually heartened to see that there's been a lot of new content um, written and produced by the family of survivors that we can see even on Netflix series today. And it's been nice for me to see that these stories are continuing to be told by the next generation who was able, that were able to connect with their own um, grandparents and parents. Um, I'm briefly gonna tell a very short portion of both my parents escaping to the United States. Um, neither one were in concentration camps, but they really had incredible stories of escape and resilience and survival. Um, my dad was born um, to a very loving family in Breslau, Germany in 1924. Um, as life became more difficult and tragic there, um, they had to try to arrange how they were going to get um, out of there. My grandmother thought that he would have a chance at an education. And so they made the very, very difficult decision to split the family up. And my dad went to England on the kinder transport in July of 1939. Um, just to put this in perspective, the Nazis invaded Poland just two months later in September. Um, his parents and um, brother went to Shanghai. And so that part of my family was part of the large Jewish community that was in Shanghai, China at the time. Um, my dad, saw his mom for the last time. When they said goodbye, she passed away in China. He was fiercely independent. He would accept nothing less than working and supporting himself at age 15 in London. He did not get the education that his mother wanted him to get. Um, he apprenticed as a tailor and initially made ladies coats and later worked in the factory making military uniforms. But when he came of age at 18, he entered the British Army. Um, he was in British intelligence because he was bilingual um, and he fought both in D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge. Um, he's related many of his war stories with um, pathos and humor. There were so many horrors to be sure in these times, which he's told us about and they definitely haunted him in his final days. Um, Jack, he only made it to 92, but my mom is 94 and still going strong. So we'll see if she gets to that 99. Um, or 100. Yeah, I share some of the humor just a little bit because I think that's how so many of our survivors were able to survive. So some of his escapades that we used to laugh about was, um, when he was in the army, he snuggled, smuggled guns to a childhood friend who was then in Belgium in a toilet tank. And um, he had to answer to his superiors in the British army when they asked about his lack of prisoner interrogations. And at that point, he was attached to a very fierce Scottish regiment whose motto was to take no prisoners. So after the war, um, he reconnected with his family um, in Hollywood. California. My mom was born in the same city in Breslau a year later in 1925. And um, as more and more liberties were taken away, they also had to decide on how they were going to escape. Um, pretty soon, 
They were only in schools with other Jewish children. Their teachers were the Jewish professors that could no longer be on the faculty at the university there. They had to vacate their apartment and move into my grandfather's law office. They were forced to take in Jewish borders so that every room was taken up by somebody. And as things became more and more scarce, um, my grandfather was able to secure two tickets for passage to Cuba. So my grandfather and my aunt left on the steamer to Cuba, Cuba with the plan of sending for my mom and my grandmother once they gained entry into the United States. My mom and my grandmother left for the United States at the end of 1940. Um, this was extremely late um, in history there. The horrors were already taking place in front of their eyes. And again, to put this in perspective, before this, earlier that year in April, um, Hitler started his blitzkrieg and invaded Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. So they left after this. And as you can imagine, Western Europe was pretty much closed to travel at that point in time. So my mom and my grandmother took this incredible journey of at least 10,000 miles um, first on the Trans-Siberian Railroad across Russia, then to Korea and to Japan, and then finally on a freighter to the United States. And then from Washington, they took the train across the United States to reunite um, with the family in New York. So both of my parents um, were born in Breslau, Germany. And the Jewish community there was actually a very tight group, very educated and, and prosperous. Um, and both were lucky enough to escape at age 15 by very, very different paths. Um, they didn't reconnect till 20 years later um, in Los Angeles here, and they were married for 65 years. My mom is still going at 94. And um, I think that, you know, my family um, for at least two additional generations now have heard many of their stories um, and really appreciate their courage um, and resilience and survival. Thank you, Robin. Beautiful remembrances of your dad and, and uh, memories of your mom. Um, tonight we want to Ask Jake Perlman is going to share some stories of his great great uncle who, who was among the liberators and a chaplain. And uh, thank you, Jake, for taking the time to uh, continue this remembrance with us. Thank you, rabbis, as everyone's saying. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jake Perlman. I'm uh, particularly happy to be sharing this story uh, at this time because it is an uplifting story that you don't always get to tell uh, around this uh, time. And it's also uh, an American perspective as well. Um, you can go to the first slide, Rabbi Max. Uh, this is my great, great uncle, Rabbi Herschel Schachter. Uh, he was born in October of 1917 in Brownsville, Brooklyn, which is a, predom well, it's a predominantly Jewish neighborhood at the time um, in the east side of Brooklyn, um, where everyone in my family has since been born, including, my, including me. Um, he is the youngest of 10 siblings, uh, which is a big reason why I got to know him because he was uh, only six years old when my grandmother was born. So his sister Pauline is my great grandmother. Um, so he was very close in age with my grandmother and was pretty much of her generation. Um, so that's how I got to know her. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Rabbi. That actually is my grandmother, Evelyn Schechter Perlman, not Schachter. It's actually very confusing with my family. Some Schachter married a Schechter. It's a whole thing. Um, she was actually a Marine herself during World War II, a Jewish Marine, a female Jewish Marine, obviously. There's a whole book about it, but that's a whole other Zoom call. You can go to the next slide. There's another picture. Isn't she pretty? Um, you can go to the first slide now, back, Max. Uh, I, I, thank you. Uh, so uh, Herschel, my Uncle Herschel, he earned his bachelor's degree from Yeshiva University in 1938. Um, and he first became a pulpit rabbi in Sanford, Connecticut. Uh, but then he enlisted in the army in 1942. 
Um, one thing I want to emphasize as a 29 year old, especially, is that he was 24 at the time when he enlisted, um, which is a crazy for me to uh, think about. Um, he became a chaplain in the Third Army's Eight, uh, eight Corps. Um, and he was there, uh, and I'm very, very proud of this next story. You can go to that picture, Max. Um, so on April 11th, 1945, uh, my uncle was actually the first U.S. Army chaplain to enter and to participate in the liberation of the Buckenwall concentration camp, barely an hour after General Patton had liberated it. He remained there for months. You can do the next slide. I just highlight that that is him right there. He remained there for months, tending to survivors and leading religious services, as this picture shows. Uh, this picture is actually proudly hangs uh, towards the end of uh, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, uh, or in Israel. Not, uh, uh, so, uh, I, my family, we had a little debate, but we believe it's at the end of the museum. Um, I actually got to visit it a couple years ago during a birthright trip, and it was a real emotional moment. I also wore glasses at the time and, and bore a striking resemblance to my uncle, and it was very, very uncanny. Um, he actually remained in Buckingham for a couple of months. Uh, he was there. Um, he helped uh, resettle thousands of orphan Jews um, during the time, uh, one of them being a teenage Elie Wiesel. Um, so that's his, you know, claim to fame in some ways, but he uh, was a really great man. He, uh, again, this when this picture was taken, he was only 27 years old. Uh, and uh, we're not exactly sure if this was the day that this happened, but because um, he was, again, there for months and he tended to these people. And uh, the story goes that like when he first came in the camp, the first thing is, where are the Jews? Where are the Jews? Send me to the Jews. And wanted to just go and reassure them that everything was gonna be okay. And as an American, like really felt like it was his duty to show a happy face and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a normal, and try to normalize the situation um, in any way possible. Um, but he uh, came back to uh, the States uh, about three years later, or about two years later, um, and then married uh, my great aunt, great aunt Panina in uh, 1948. He later in his life was sent to the Soviet Union and was part of an American rabbinic delegation who advocated for the rights of Soviet Jews. Um, and then he also later served as an advisor for Rabbi, uh, for not Rabbi, for President Nixon. Wow, what a Freudian slip there. Um, but we don't have to get into that. Uh, he died uh, at the age of 95 uh, in uh, 2013. Um, I was uh, in my final months of college, so I could not attend the funeral, but my father tells me that it was really one of the most incredible moments of his life being there real there were generations of survivors and you know people probably in that photo right there who came and paid his pay their respects for him and um it was a it's a i'm really really proud to have this lineage and in my family we're all very proud of it we're really proud of this photo that we get to share um with everyone and also again it's a different side of this Holocaust that often doesn't get to be spread. Um, so I'm happy that the connection that I do have is a positive one. Um, and I'm really happy to be able to share it with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jake, for that uh, sharing his story. All of the stories we've heard tonight are deeply felt. Um, and they are, thank you for each for sharing uh, both the pain, uh, the suffering, and the triumphs uh, and the resiliency and the fact that we honor their lives and continue to honor their stories is what Yom HaShoah is deeply, deeply about. And so as we um, honor each of them, we sing uh, Olam Chesed Yibane together, let us build a world of love, learning from their stories, holding their stories and uplifting their stories together. Olam chesed ibane, yada da 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 da
세리 만에 prayer speaks of God full of compassion, that even in our darkest hours, our God is with us. And even as we are in our dark hour of sheltering in place, um, our God is with us. And so let us remember and pray, give honor to those who perish during the Shoah, as we ask this God of compassion to remember them, to rest, to have clear and perfect comfort for their souls as we chant El Male together. Rabbi? El Male Rachamim Shochen Bam Romim Hamtei Menucha Nechona Tachat Kanfei HaShechina Vimalot kedoshim uteorim ke zohar haraki hamazhirim Et nishmot shisha milyon achenu veachyotenu Shenehergu al kidush Hashem Baal HaRachamim Yasireim Beseter Knafav Leolamim Vitror Bitror HaChaim Et Nishmatam Adonai Hunachalatam Vyanuchu b'shalom al mishkavam Vinomar Amen Fully compassionate God on high To our six million brothers and sisters murdered because they were Jews Grant clear and certain rest with you In the lofty heights of the sacred and pure Whose brightness shines like the very glow of heaven Source of mercy and compassion, forever enfold them in the embrace of your wings. Secure their souls in eternity. Adonai, they are now yours. They will rest in peace. And let us all say, Amen. The Kaddish prayer we say in memory of specific loved ones. We recall especially all those who died in Auschwitz and Lodz and Ponar and Babiar, Majdanek, Birkenau, Kovno, and Janowska, Theresienstadt, Buchenwald, Treblinka, Vilna, Bergen-Belsen, Matthausen, Dachau, Minsk, and Warsaw, and all of the many, many places and large where our ancestors, our family members, died during the Shoah. We're going to just open up the mics for just a moment. And if you are remembering specific people yes, tonight, please say the num names of your loved ones, either right, who perished in the Shoah or who you're saying Kaddish for now. 
33 members of my family that were killed in Russia. The memories of all of them are blessings. We recite the Kaddish together. Bagala Vizman Kari Ru Ame Yehe Shme Rabba Mivarach Leolam Omeo Maya Yit Barach Vishdabach Vit Paar Vit Ramam Vit Nase Vit Adar Vit Ale Vit Halal Shme de Kudusha Brit Leilam in Kobir Katava Shirak Bachish Pachata Venechemata Dami Ran Bilma Vit Ru Ame Yehe Shlama Rabba Vit Shemaya Bahai Malenu Vial Ko Yisrael Vimru Ome O Se Shalom Vimroma Uya Se Shalom Malenu Vial Ko Yisrael O Yisrael Vimru Ome May the one who makes peace in the highest of heaven help us to make peace here on earth with one another and grant eternal peace to all who perished all of our loved ones who perished in the Shoah and let us all say Amen May their memories always be for a blessing. Zichor nam libracha. We're in Shavuot. We take this moment to count the Omer as we anticipate and look forward to Shavuot. Ineni muchanu mazuman l'kayem mitzvah dasei shel sirata Omer. I'm ready to fulfill the mitzvah of the counting of the Omer. Baruch atad unai Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher kitshanu mitzvah. Sivano al Sfirata Omer. Amen. Praise for you, Adonai, sovereign of the universe, who hallows us with mitzvot, commanding us to count the Omer. Ayom Shne Masar Yamim Shehem Shavu Echad Bachamisha Yamim La Omer. Today is 12 days of counting the Omer, which is one week and five days of the Omer period. Again, I want to deeply thank. Um, Jack and Larry and Robin and Jay sharing their family stories. Uh, and I wanna also thank each of you for being here. I know many of you on, on this uh, gathering tonight also have relatives who perished and or survived. And your presence here means so much that we can share this time together to honor our loved ones, to light our candle in memoriam, to sing together, to pray together, and most of all, to tell the stories, the hidden stories uh, that uh, are, is up to us to embody and to hold on to as a sacred, sacred memory. We close our time together with an Ose Shalom uh, as we sing together. Ose Shalom check the temple calendar for all of the activities and opportunities to gather here online with one another. Uh, this coming Thursday, uh, Rabbi Chaikin is going to uh, regale us with a beautiful virtuoso, vir a virtual virtuoso concert. Uh, and then again, services are Friday night at 6.30. Uh, 
Uh, tomorrow uh, we have our uh, uh, last support group for those who are anxious or isolated at 4.30 and all of that. You can uh, click on the links to register on the Temple website at kol-ami.org, kol-ami.org. We're glad you joined us tonight. Thank you for being with us. Uh, may the memories of all those we recall tonight be a blessing for us and for all of our people. We are the heirs. We are the ones who keep our faith alive, who keep our people alive, despite the evils that were perpetrated, perpetrated upon our ancestors and our family. May you go forth from this time of remembrance, holding their memories close as a blessing and living each and every day the fullness of joy of our Jewish lives as a testament to each of them. Thank you for being here tonight. Erev Tov. Erev Tov.